I'm not on drugs tonight. Hello, hello. Now that we've done our technology thing, we're almost ready to go here. Herself, and then she can go over there, and she's got stuff on display over here on the table. And then for the members, we'll do a short uh, meeting after her presentation. So don't go away. But but the, the, the others of you, you're excused. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Thank you, Mark. Yes, I will tell you. So um, Introduction myself is I'm an anthropologist. I went to uh, Western undergraduate and did my master's. And these are my friends. When I lived here, my brother lives here. My mother lives here. Just passed away a few years ago. My mother's husband lives here. So I have. I'm very fond of Bellingham. I <laughs> have a lot of connections. If I could. I'd probably move back right now, but time, life doesn't allow us to do that. Certain times. I'm. I'm an anthropologist. Uh, right now I'm. My, I suppose you want to give me a position. I'm an affiliate um, associate professor in the Department of Anthropology at University of Washington and also with the Canadian Studies Center, even though I have never published anything in Canada, in their Arctic program. So they invited me to come in. I pointed out that I hadn't published anything in Canada, but they said, well, that's all right. You can do some field trips with us. And you could start doing it. Oh, that's good. <laughs> I love the Canadian Studies Department. <laughs> so I've, I've been doing research in Iceland for a few years, and I'm delighted to be invited here. And I'll start out just by, it's about sea women, so I'll start out, people keep, I'm not of Icelandic descent, or Norwegian descent, and so people always ask me, um, why did I ever get involved in this? <laughs> so I read a section of the book, um, to explain that. And it also gives you an idea of how the book you know, sounds like. <laughs> this is a book thing, off the part of the book. So, okay. So we'll see if I can see this. Okay. The year I first encountered Iceland was 1999, and Iceland Air was trying, again, <laughs> to promote direct flights from Seattle to Reykjavik. The flights were surprisingly cheap. I didn't have much money, but I had time and a reason to go. My Icelandic friend Disa had received a grant to work on a scientific study in her native Iceland, and she'd invited me to visit her. Disa, who had shared my home in Seattle for some months, now said she had an apartment in Reykjavik with an extra bedroom. Well, why not, I thought. <laughs> And with that dangerous thought in mind, I booked a ticket. Why do such impulsive decisions so often become life-changing? Perhaps because they are out of the ordinary. By allowing ourselves to step away from the conventional, we have already made ourselves more open. Experiencing something completely new jolts us into noticing the layered meanings of small happenings. At these times, 
Our increased attention transforms the superficially mundane. And so it would be with this trip to Iceland. Like so many visitors to Iceland before and after me, I fell in love. In Seattle, I wait for the intensity of color that comes during those long summer twilights when the sun rise, rides close to the horizon. At this time, shadows seem solid. The very air changes, feeling almost fluid. In Iceland, this kind of light comes whenever the sun shines. That May, I experienced 3 a.m. conversations where late loses its meaning as seemingly endless twilight moves between strands of amber rose to magenta, the shadows etched in cobalt. Then, at some point, almost unnoticed, the twilight shifts not to dark, but to the solid light of a new day. I was learning that the definition of night is malleable. Disa <coughs> wanted to show me her country, so one sunny, cold, and windy day, we drove out to the small coastal community of Stokseri. In this Iceland, before the country's 2008 economic crash, while Reykjavik celebrated in frenetic, if somewhat innocent opulence, unaware of impending economic disaster, Stokseri seemed a bit lost. A few scattered modern buildings stood isolated in the grass. A large box-like building at the corner of at the center of town, previously a fish factory, seemed abandoned, with only two small tourist shops inhabiting its huge echoing interior. I wondered how often actual tourists found the place. <laughs> Along the water's edge ran a low stone wall, which allowed you a view of the sea, but not of the rocky shore. Disa told me that the sea had flooded this town several times. Young yellow grasses and courageous early flowers swept toward the horizon in all directions. When I mentioned how deserted the town felt, Disa said, Iceland is a place of very old communities, and what you see is Stokseri's survival. In 1403, smallpox killed off half the people of this country. Another 25% died in a plague of 1707. Then, with the ash clouds from the volcanic eruptions of 1783, arrived a year when summer never came. 80% of the sheep and ox and cattle, sorry, 80% of the sheep and over half of the horses and cattle died from starvation and fluoride poisoning. It was a hungry spring with nothing to eat. A quarter of Iceland's population died that year. She looked at the stone wall where a solitary raven now stood. It was a ghost spring. We wandered the empty streets and found among the yellow houses a windowless stone hovel. Its low sod roof <coughs> and surrounding grassy stone wall in distinct disrepair. What's that? I asked. Here's a sign, Disa said. She walked over to the small stone plaque and began translating the Icelandic. This is a reconstruction of the winter fishing hut of Thuríður Enisdóttir, one of Iceland's greatest fishing captains. She lived from 1777 to 1863, rowed from Stokseri, and was acclaimed for both bringing in the largest catches and for never losing a single crew member in the 60 years she fished. Wait, I said, she? This renowned fishing captain was a woman? I felt a quiet chill that then spread along my arms to my fingers. I knew I was in the presence of a remarkable story. Yes, my grandmother used to tell us stories about her. Wow, I paused. And what about today? Are there lots of fisherwomen in Iceland today? I don't know, Medusa said. I've never heard of any. <laughs> and with that began what became 
a mystery and a quest. I worked at sea myself when I was in my early 20s, late teens and early 20s, and it seemed to me that if I could work as a deckhand at sea, and I did it in the Northwest here, and in Australia, and in the South Pacific, if I could do it, Iceland has a reputation as the greatest gender equality in the world. Surely women work to see in Iceland. And yet when I started looking around, what everybody said is there weren't any and there were none in the history either. So, time went by, I had another job. But eventually I was able to go back because I was always curious. It just, there was something didn't quite work on this. And I was, I was able to get a grant, and I hired a research assistant, and we started to go through all these documents, all this history. We combed through the history. And one of the things that's wonderful about Iceland, if you're doing research, is, which many of you may know, is that it has an incredible history of literacy. From their saga, their, which is still some of the most remarkable literature known to the world, from that time on, almost everybody could read at least enough to read religious texts. They had one of the earliest printing presses, um, went from Europe to Iceland in the 1500s. And Icelanders have told me again and again well, first I have to say that they lost their independence in 1245, and they didn't get it back until 1945, so there were 700 <coughs> years where they were a completely impoverished colony of Denmark, with a huge amount of starvation, and they were living in very, very dire circumstances. Incredible poverty. And what Icelanders have told me again and again and again is, we may not have had food to eat, but everyone had at least one book in a household. And that is a remarkable tradition. And you have this group of lay, they were farmers. But what they did is they started writing things down. They copied the sagas, because the printing press was reserved really for these religious texts. And so to save the sagas, they started copying them on, on sheepskin, on whatever they could get. And they started um, doing poetry and writing it down. To be a poet in Iceland is still one of the highest professions you can have, to be a scholar. And they still write poetry for a funeral, for a celebration, for a uh, ribbon cutting, for anything. They'll do a poem, still today. So they would write it down. And then these people, these farmers, and it was almost, almost entirely men, but they would go around and they started interviewing all their neighbors and their, their family and everybody. And they started writing down oral history, basically. And if those men thought that women were worth talking about, which luckily a decent number did, then we have a written history of day-to-day -day life of women, of the common people, which you have in almost no other country. It's remarkable. Because of the, they did these, and it was just like, you know, they'd write it down at the time, when we started going through all these old um, books and documents, you could find verbatim the women saying, I did this, and this is what it was like. So you had women telling what it was like to go to sea in the 1600s, in the 1700s, and in the 1800s. It was amazing. We found, going through this, accounts of not just dozens, not hundreds, but thousands, thousands of women. With corroboration from these people and what people said, being conservative, I can say with complete confidence that a full third of the Icelandic fishing fleet during these decades or these centuries were women. They were captains, they were helmsmen, they were renowned for their weather reading, um, they were sealers, they fished pregnant, there are stories of some of them giving birth, a lot of them both, being pregnant, getting into labor, just barely making it. They, they rode, they were very strong, they were renowned for their strength. It was so common that, also when you see the death records, a huge number of the people dying in the boats were women. 
Um, it was so accepted. Basically, you know, we keep talking about them in anthropology or places, you talk about the sea is a male space because it's only men who do this kind of stuff. It's not true. For these centuries in Iceland, it was not. Women were expected to be on sea completely as much as men. Um, and they were not even mentioned unless they did something else remarkable, because going to sea wasn't remarkable at all. So they had to be in trouble with, to have court cases against them, be renowned for some reason. The one with the um, reconstructed fishing hut, she was renowned because she was so clever. She was an amazing, she was, she was an incredible sea captain in the rowboats, and she was so good at reading weather that all the other boats in the area would end up following her. If the weather was not so great, she could go out. When others were afraid to go out, she would go out and would always get better. She was fantastic at reading weather. And there were times when it didn't look so bad as she just went for sure. One of the early times that happened, some other boats were out still, and tragically enough, a big storm came up very quickly, and um, they had a very hard time getting in, and one of the boats turned right near the shore, and all the people drowned, and people could see them. After that, everybody in that area followed her. They would just, if she went in, they'd go, whoops, uh, I guess we're pulling up to them, we're going. And if she went out, they looked bad, they'd go, huh, she's going to get two runs today, because it's going to get better if she's going out. But also, she had observational skills of Sherlock Holmes. A remarkable person, and she became a detective. This is true, in the 1700s and 1800s, she became a detective. And the colonial authorities made her work for him, even when she didn't want to. And she would solve these crimes by these, and they're so recorded. And she helped people all over the place. She also went to court a lot on behalf of women who were being abused by their husbands. She went to court if anybody harassed her at all. She wore trousers, which was against the law, but she did anyway. And if somebody said, one guy, he said, when she was older, she was about 80, she was still running up and down the hills chasing the sheep. And one of her neighbors said, well, said, I'd like to see what's under those trousers. And the term used in Iceland is a rude term, basically means two tools. <laughs> that means, and, and she said, I, you know, you can, just, you can just look underneath if you like. And she promptly sued him for harassment and won. And the pastor made him meekly apologize. <laughs> so, you know, this is when she was eight. And she did it all her life. If anybody said anything, she just sued them, and she always. <laughs> so she's quite renowned. It's quite amazing all the stuff, information about her. In fact, my next book is going to be about her. My next year, first you know. So, um, and, but then there's, for instance, another woman who was also in the 1700s who was renowned for her poetry. Um, beautiful, beautiful poetry, which we've translated. Disa, the person I call Disa in the book. Um, she and I have translated some. We have some, quite a bit of poetry in the book, which we took ages to translate, um, because we tried to get some of the rhyming and feeling of the Icelandic. The Icelandic is better, but whatever. This is one, this is a woman who's called Lafjubir. She was very, very strong rower and renowned for being good at sea. Um, here's one she wrote while they were out in a storm, which amazingly, these poems have been preserved. So here's the one while she's out in a storm. I beg of the blood-haired waves, whose frothing veils harass, haughty sea goddess daughters, please will you spare my ass? <laughs> <laughs> the ass is a direct translation. <laughs> we worked back from that, and everything was going to rhyme with ass. I'm just going to tell you, I was going to get that. 1700s, I write it, it's going on. So, Here's another one. Um, the thing is, you were rowing these boats, and if the person next to you couldn't row as well as you could, it meant you did more work, because they made the boat unbalanced. So that was, people got irritated if somebody couldn't row as well. And she was apparently a very strong rower, by all reports, and here's another poem she made for the amusement of her fellow crew, except for presumably the hapless object. Okay. Do row better, my dear man. Fear not to hurt the ocean. Use your shoulders if you can. The sea will heal despite your motion. <laughs> 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 
And she, she wrote tons of poetry, just beautiful, beautiful poetry. And she was known for that. What was amazing for us, I, I have so many stories, I could just go on and on and on. A woman who was so renowned um, for her strength, the guys had carried one hundred pound bag, she carried two. She, there are stories of, she was apparently very attractive, she was in the late 1800s, these guys making, what did they say, trying to have their pleasure with her when she was alone, aka assaulting her. And she would end up, the whole town would go, these are all said to be, this happened about three or four times, apparently. These are all said to be, because she was very independent, she felt by herself all the time. And the townspeople would just go, okay, we'll see what happens now. Nobody would ever worry about going and saving her. And there's these great stories. There's a story one guy went up into an attic to try and assault her, basically, while she's up there spinning. And the next thing, she's going down the attic stairs with him under her arm, with his trousers around his ankles, <laughs> swearing his head off at her. She takes him, carries him through the town, and tosses him into the ocean. <laughs> People say they thank you. So he says, I mean, these are amazing stories, and they're their stories, and their words, a lot of them. It's phenomenal. What was remarkable is the Icelanders didn't know anything about this. So, so what happened? This whole history has been erased. It makes us realize how much we can, all of us, this is not Iceland, we all do this, is we create a reality. We recreate our history. We create what we think is reality, which is women were on shore. That only started to happen in the 1900s. They had no superstition before then either. But then you can see toward the beginning of the night, late 1800s, you begin to see it's a real shift. And this is when there was this, I, Iceland wanted to be much trying to be more modern. They got much more influence from Europe. Um, things were dramatically changing. They didn't have an industrial revolution in Iceland. That was really when motors came to the boats. So they could go out further, they could get more fish. That revolutionized Iceland because then you needed boats to be in harbors instead of being dragged up to shore. And everybody then moved to fishing communities. So a lot of the communities, not Stoksari, Stoksari is about a thousand years old, but a lot of the other communities, and it's just scattered farms, which is the way it all was before. But a, a huge number of the ones that are actual fishing towns did start until the 1900s, early 1900s, when they all went to harbors. It was at that time. But you see him you see him saying she was as good at sea as she was at the at the new. She liked to go to sea almost as much as she liked being in the kitchen. Probably more right? mm -hmm. She she you know, and then you get to see it changing, saying there's trying to say that these women were like hags, that they're not feminine, and they should be feminine. It's, it's they starts to be um, a bad they're seen as bad people. It's very interesting. And then, then you get the woman being on shore and the men going out in the trawlers in the early 1900s, but it doesn't happen until then. But, starting in the 1930s, they crawl the way back. First as cooks on the herring boats, and later in the 40s they worked while the men, the Icelandic men mostly, they did a lot of where they took fish, to, they basically fed Britain. They, made, they, they fed Britain during the war, and a lot of them died taking fish from Iceland across the water to England. And they were bombed a lot by the Germans. But that's what most of them did. And they kept them in bed. Amazing service during the war. And the women stayed home and fished. They worked on the boats in Iceland. In the 50s, now I've interviewed hundreds, several hundred women from the 50s to the present who worked to sea. Current times, they have also filled all sorts of roles. Um, they, they have, a, they've been about between 10 to 13 percent of the fishing fleet. Is, I can get statistics from the 90s, but I can see in the 70s there was a surge. But now it became a feminist act. Now they knew they were going against the current. And every single woman I talked to didn't know that there were other women doing it. They thought they were the only one. They were in their small communities. They, it was something they had to do alone. So they all had their stories of going against what everybody said they should be doing and going to see. And what, how they finangled their way up, you know. The skipper was well, drunk and he wanted to go to a dance, so she said she'd drive him there, but he had to take her his cream with her. You know, they, they had all these great stories about it. And then they went to see, they, they had worked with skippers, 
they take skipper, the, the small boat skipper license for boats 30 tons and less in Iceland. The Icelandic, it's slang, but it's used by everybody. I've never heard another word, I, I've never heard whatever the formal word is for this. But what everybody calls the small boat skipper license is the pump throw, which means scrotum test. Oh. <laughs> balls. <laughs> Many women in Iceland have passed their balls. <laughs> um, and they're marine engineers, um, they're deckhands, they're cooks, they're all, the, they were radio operators when they had the radios. And starting in the late 70s, then you got women going to the navigational school and becoming qualified to be on the largest vessels. So, um, I'll just, I'll show you the pictures, I'm just going to do this at the end, but one, just stop around here, but I just want to say well, a couple, one thing that I thought was really fascinating that I found. Um, oh, I'll say something else too quickly, but every, you know, I'm, I'm an anthropologist, so I read all the literature, you know, everything that all the scholars have written in any, you know, in English and any other language I can finagle my way through. All of them said there are very few women working at sea, and the reason they don't is because there's so much sexism on the boats, and the men harass them, and the men don't want them there, and so that's why they don't work at sea. Now, I must say, I did not find that. And I fished in Australia in the late 70s, in a sexist country. I found that once they saw that I could do the work, it was just fine. Every single a successful Icelandic woman, which about all of my interviews, I mean, there are a couple who, for reasons they couldn't handle it, as they say, working at sea is not for everybody, man or woman. You have to be a specific kind of person, and some people just aren't, man and woman. But for all those who stayed at sea and were successful, every single one of them said that after, uh, this is in you know, the 1900s, is more recent, up to the present, 2000, 2000, 2000 but after they went through a proving period that they now had to go through because it was the idea women weren't strong and couldn't do it, that's all part of us idea now. Once they passed that, the men became their best friends. And I saw this, I went through a lot of parts, a lot of drinking, a lot of fun, and they were, they were obviously their best friends. They said, though, that the continued discrimination was from shore, and it was from both men and women. And it went for years. And they said, you're a dyke or a whore, and sometimes you're both, in the estimation of the people on shore. Say that again and again. So that's very different than, and I saw it. And I'll show you some pictures to show it. But, um, so I'll just show you some of these pictures, just to give you an idea of some of the stuff I'm talking about. Um, Go ahead. Yeah. This is... Just to give you an idea, this is a very, very calm seas in a place where I've spent a lot of time going to visit. But just to give you an idea of, for those of you who haven't seen Iceland, many of you have seen Norway, so you have an idea of what the fjords look like. But, you know, we're looking at pretty harsh circumstances. Yeah, that's okay. And on the north, although this is happening less and less with global warming, you have certain um, friends coming near the boats. She's off troll in the winter. Um, they talked to me, this one woman was just talking to me saying, oh yeah, you know, when our boat got stuck in the ice, it was a problem, we had to get rescued by an icebreaker. I thought, bloody hell, that's really scary. You know, I used to crush, I mean, it's like the thing with David Shackleton and stuff. She goes, yeah, well, yeah. She's worked to see. <laughs> okay, but it's now been reconstructed. The town has reconstructed it again. It's not in disrepair anymore. They're taking great care of it. They have a much bigger sign. Um, and so this was what the winter fishing huts were like. This is what they were, they were like the Irish black huts. They're sawed on the top to keep them warm. They didn't have any wood. Iceland doesn't have trees. So they had, they built them out of stone. And they, a lot of times, didn't have fires in them either. They were cold. But the sawed would keep it warm. It was very good insulation. And that's what they had. Um, go ahead. <coughs> These are paintings uh, by a guy, Gary Jonsson. This is, it's not correct actually, but this is a painting of the, um, the sorry, go back, can you yes, go back? I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I told you. Oh no. Well, 
Well, that I'll tell you as you try to figure it out. The um, that boat, it was the woman. They, he actually painted this woman who is the skipper of that boat, and she is Haldora. And she's also called Haldora Klopser all the time. Although there's never a mention of any disability. <laughs> but she actually. She mostly, this is the 1700s, she mostly always took all female crews. She didn't, she always had an all, all female crews. And she had two brothers who also had, had boats, this fairly wealthy family. So they had three boats, all the siblings were running them. And they used to have competitions all the time. Guess who won? Almost all of us. In fact, it, it was said that she made her brothers wealthy because she brought in so much fish. So she was quite a remarkable person too. She also took people. She also um, stood up on behalf of other women and went to court. One thing, the court system in Iceland did work. And so that was great. She took people to court as well. If you had the wherewithal to do it. So I'll say one other thing that was very interesting while we're waiting for this is that we also found this law. This is remarkable. I have to go to Denmark because I don't know anything about why this law was enacted. That's sort of my next. In my next research, I'm going to sneak over there and do it. I don't have the grant to do it, but we're just going to. So it's, it's, we found that in 1720, 1720, there was a law enacted by the Danish king, Frederick, for Icelanders, for women to get the same wage as men for the men's work of cutting sod, cutting peat, and rolling, which in Iceland means fishing. I still use this word for it today. So that meant that from 1720, women got an equal share to men. And as far as I could find, that has always been honored. Now it was that they had this system where you were basically indentured to a farmer. So you're a farmhand, and if you were a woman working for the farmer, the farmer got your share, and then you got trapped. But if you could do it independently, you got an equal share. And that's still the case today. So it was a one way that women could make equal wages to men. And even in the 1990s, in Iceland, <coughs> rural Iceland, up until the 1990s, because the, the fish factories played crack, women earned 55% of what men earned. Mm -hmm. It was gender equality. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Whereas if they went to sea, they could get equal wages. And so this is what a lot of women said. I was a teenager. I was working in the fish factory. All the guys were making tons of money. Why couldn't they? And so they go and do it. And that's or women get divorced. That's how they look after their children. It's quite remarkable. It's because they can make money. So if we can work this thing, we can't. We can't. We can't. What I can do is why don't you just if anybody has any questions, you can just ask the questions because that's basically what you said. Um, how many in a boat? What's that? How many women were in a boat? It, it, yeah, just say your questions because in the dark you can't really. Just go ahead. Um, it was, it, they, they didn't have sails in Iceland until like 1850 to the late 1800s. But it was usually, they had as few as four up to eight, usually, people in a boat. They weren't larger than that. And I think one thing, the Icelandic population was so, was so low that it was, they couldn't, and they couldn't really take larger boats. They didn't have enough crew in each area because they were going to be scattered farms. The boats were also incredibly expensive because they had to bring them over from Norway a lot and Denmark because they didn't have the trees, their boat wouldn't, and they didn't have the trees to build them, so they had to be imported. So that was very expensive. Um, Did they use nets? No, each person had their own tackle and line, and this was also very, very um, uh, prized because the Danish had a monopoly, and so you could only get sort of what they allowed coming to Iceland. So twine was really valued, and so everybody had their own tackle, and they jealously kept that. And so each person on the boat was fishing, line fishing off their own their own tackle. Yeah, very interesting. So you know. And they have this word called fisting, which means you attract the fish to you. So if you, if you take that, get a fish, if you got fish a lot, then you became known as fisting. And people really wanted you on the boat. It didn't matter if you were at all. You'd be very sorry. So, 
They were breaking in the... Yeah. Oh, oh, oh it's, it's quite dramatic. Yeah, it's, it's great stories. So, and you are Yeah. I was thinking it was the, the death raised from those tra tragic disease epidemics, as well as the Danish servitude. Surely built robust people. I mean, I would think the women may have been, you know, really healthy, robust. They, they were. It was intriguing, though, because we had this system that there were tons of people, if you weren't able to uh, support your kids, or if one of them died, or if you, like, one of the parents died, or if they're too poverty, you were farmed out. This is how the farmers kept the labor in the face of the almost free labor, the elite of all the other, it was basically a surf system. And so if you, if you had nobody, uh, you didn't usually get enough food. And so it says in the comment, she was particularly strong having always got enough food. So that was a really important thing. And these, when they go for the fishing stations in the summer, they would have these, where they would live in very rudimentary housing, sometimes just in caves. And during the migration system, people would go to these areas where the fish were, close to shore, and they would get tons of fish and, and you know, salt it and dry it and stuff like that. And it was, bit, it was, it was difficult to row there. They'd have to row a long way, and then they'd stay there in these very harsh conditions. But these women really liked it because they got enough food there. It was a very different situation. They weren't under the thumb of a farmer. Um, and then I thought about it later, and there are all these scattered farms with nobody around except the farmer and the wife and then who they are. Whereas when they're in these fishing stations, it was actually a real community. And at that time, there really weren't much in the way of towns in Iceland. And that was the, like, they all said it's a fun and free environment. Women talk about that, and they try and negotiate to go there if they were a farmer. Interesting. So, yeah, you're right. They, if they have enough to eat, they were. And then, they have the highest infant mortality rate in Europe until the late 1800s. And one thing, this woman who did this great book called The State of the Child, and I signed she, it was a so she found out that they didn't breastfeed their kids. And they were feeding them water down cow's milk and things like that, and the kids were dying. And that, then the, finally by the 1800s, late 1800s, they got them to change. Oh, good. And so within, by the early 1900s, they then had the highest infant survival in Europe. Totally switched from one to the other. And it's what you're suggesting, Joan, I think people say it's because their food was clean, their water was clean. If you survived infancy, then your chances of surviving to a you know, good old age were really high in Iceland, unlike most of Europe at that, for quite some time, even for impoverished people. So this is this, how though it is, both painted but slightly inaccurate because they have all men. But he said for her. Is it, oh, very few pictures of women in the past. Only, okay, go ahead. Can you go forward? Mm -hmm. Oh, good. So this you see, he has this, this is a picture, just a picture of, you know, the boats would just flip really easily. Later they had sails. They were round bottom boats, so they would really flip really easily. And this is just a, a depiction of this. Go ahead. And then here, they would bring them in through the surf. So they'd be rolling, surfing, and this is a lava shore. And then they would drag them up on shore, and they'd use whale ribs as rollers. Did that would, remember? So they'd use whale ribs, and they'd just roll them up on whale ribs, and then run around and take it to the back. And that's how they took them down, too. It's quite marvelous. Go ahead. Oh, oh, there it is. Oh, good. So one thing that I was really happy, oh no, can you go now? So that last picture, one, that, this is taken in 19... One more. Is one, this more. one more. Can you yeah. come back one more? Yeah, I'm just trying. Yeah. There we go. This is from 1900, um, and this is, they're larger by then, they've got, the, the, this is a larger boat, um, and they had more people, this of course, more people who would be rowing. It's obviously a Sunday, they're all dressed up in their Sunday best, <laughs> and they've got a sail. But looking at the register of this boat, there were more women than men working on this boat. And they're all there. It's amazing to have this picture on photograph from 1900 of this boat with these women. Okay, go ahead. 
Okay, this one I was really excited when we found. We found, we found all these in the archives. I have to say, Iris from the Maritime Museum in Iceland helped me find these. This is a fan, this is from 1944, and you can see they're still using the old style boat. Although I'm sure they've got a motor on it at this point. But it's still got the old Orlocks. This is obviously a very old boat. They're still using the family. And they're still using the lines out. So this obviously looks like a husband and wife and some other probably crew member. So, but this little boy, all these women that I interviewed now, I'd say, so how old were you when you first went out to sea with your family? And they go, five, six. I go, really? Yeah. 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 Really, I went out when I was two, but I wasn't really working then. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought, but I heard this again and again and again. That's how they become fishermen. They go out with their families really young, and the women do, the girls do, as well as the boys. And I thought, nobody's going to believe me. I'm sorry. I'm going to say this, and everybody's going to say, yeah, right. <laughs> Photograph. Ha. It's a boy, but it's somebody. He looks like he's about five or six. This is just some women fishing. Um, in the, um, they fished through the, two women fished, they went out together for about 20 years together. Um, they've both retired now. Um, but one of them, the one time they didn't go out together, one of them got it, their boat crashed. And the other one, it was, I have the story in the book, it's very, she made it through, I'll give you the spoiler, but thank goodness, she made it through, but it was terrifying. They said, never again, we'll never go out separately again. Is that fish in the water beside the net? Yeah, 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 exactly. It's the net and it's the fish coming out from the net. Exactly. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, this is another woman in Bali who um, she fishes with her family. She fishes with her uh, her husband, her daughter, her son, and her daughter-in-law. So that's their. They have three boats. They run now. They're doing very well, actually. Fishing for, they have a whole, this whole complicated with um, the quotas, the fishing, getting the fishing rights, which they privatized in Iceland for cod, but they fish for a fish called grasslepper, which is um, lumpfish. I've never heard of it, honestly. It's an Arctic fish. Now they, they just take its row. Although now they're finding things to do with its meat as well, sending it to Asia. It's a very fatty. What type of fish was that? Lumpfish. It's round. Um, and they just take its roe and sell it in Asia. So, um, here, this is a woman in Lima. She's got this hilarious story. She's been fishing, she's been working in sea about, oh, 35 years, 37 years. Um, and she gives this hilarious story also about how she, how she first got on sea is she thought, well, nobody's going to take me. She said, I really want to go to sea. And so, she, so she went to fishery school and became a, like an inspector, a fisheries inspector. And she has been doing that now for, for some years. And go ahead. Um, and here she is at the helm. She's now she's very experienced. She also, which I don't have, but she's got, she, gave me, she gave me a whole bunch of pictures. Some of them with her rifle. All this ammunition around her hips. And then there's another one with her pulling a bird. Dead bird, obviously, got with the rifle. I might say that shooting a bird from a moving boat, you have to get a bloody one shot. So, Okay. Um, this is a woman, Sigrid, and she is the first woman to become a large vessel skipper. She started in the 70s, um, to, and she became um, qualified as a skipper of the largest vessels, Coast Guard, everything. And she spent a lot of her um, career traveling around the world, and um, a lot in first mate positions, and uh, she's now returned to become a kindergarten teacher, actually. <laughs> so, okay. She says she loves both. She says they're both wonderful to do. Is it going? Oh, okay. This, I love this picture. These last two pictures, I just have because I just love them. This woman in the middle is Inga Fani. She was also one of the very first um, to become a qualified skipper. Um, and she worked on fishing boats for a long time. This is, she's now, she just had her 60th birthday, actually. Mm -hmm. And she's been working at sea this whole time, all around the world. Um, she went and worked in um, Namibia for three years. Her husband, who was also a skipper, um, but he took three years off to take care of their kid and went to Namibia with them. So they took turns being caregiver. Um, but, because in these boats, she'd be gone for as much as a month at a time. But here, she is first mate. 
This is, and these are her crew. And just to give you an example, I mean, they look like they totally adore her. I mean, it's pretty obvious. There's the, yeah. <laughs> so she's also as cute as button. Why so. wouldn't they? Yeah. Well, why wouldn't they? That's exactly my question. I know. She's like, this is Diana. It's amazing how many people I've met, how many women I've met who say, oh, that looks just like me when I was younger. <laughs> anyway, go on. This is the last one. I love this photograph. This is her again. And she, when she said she was the, of the first mate on these boats, these early boats, she now works on container ships, by the way. She said, look, when you're younger, you do the fishing. When you get older, I'm sorry, container ships are just more comfortable. <laughs> so she does. She does this great trip, which I was supposed to take this fall. I didn't get to go on. Go later on. It goes from the pharaohs down to Europe, comes back. So here she, she, she hired these other two women. She said, screw it, you know. They were friends of hers. She really liked them. So here she is the first name. She, the next um, woman is the deckhand, and she's the cook for this um, trawler they were on. So it's just a great picture when she was younger. So, so that's really basically the pictures. I just want to show you some pictures. It gives you an idea of the vibrancy of everything. And to tell you, because um, University of Washington Press has me take books with me, so I do have books to sell. They have me take books. So if you'd like me to sign them, so they are just take So that's it. So Anybody else do it, but they, that's the way they do it in Norway. 
Is it? Yeah. So yeah. in Iceland, they, they well they dry it. It's not smoked. But well, they dry the same it thing. Because yeah, it gets very. It's much smaller. You're right. It's whatever. That guy on TV. Well, I think what's the guy that has a program? That Big Steve's. Travels all over the country. Well, I just had to watch a, a, a program from Iceland, and he was showing them drying the fish, but also the sheep. They put for them every part of the sheep they possibly can, but they, that's the way they, they hang the meat up, and they, it hangs there for nine months, and the salt air dries it, dries it right out. And he was. They carve it off with a real thin paper. Yeah. Yeah. Paper. Yeah. Yeah. What, what do they call it? What do they call it? Yeah. They talked about the fact these women who were the cooks on the early boats, early boats, being up until the late 80s, they talked about they didn't have any refrigeration. And so they would take whole carcasses, they said, and they just hang it in the boat. And then, as a part of their cook's job, they also did deck work all the early cook's days. So to say it was just to cook is completely ridiculous. They got paid more than the other the deck a cook gets paid more than the deck has. There's a reason for it. But at that time they would have this this meat just hanging up and they'd go on the deck and just carve sits off and then go down and use it in the meal. So the whole time they were out. So, so yeah, there's these women that have you said sometimes they have a baby while they're out at sea. What did they do then? Oh, well, I only have one report, one account of an actual birth at sea. Um, but I have several, I found several accounts of them going into labor and desperately in a storm or something and desperately trying to get to shore as they're going into labor. Um, the one of the woman um, who giving birth at sea, it's a hysterical story. She's with her husband and she goes into labor and she gives birth in the rowboat. While they're out there, and it says, this is what the, this is what the actual text says. It says, her husband, with no knife at hand, bit the umbilical cord with his worn out teeth. <laughs> Maybe he was a snaggle tooth. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll, I'll pass on that. <laughs> You say going to sea. What I observed there. Oh dear. <coughs> what, my, my interpretation of them going to sea was more of a day or two or three day issue, not for a long length of time. You're not going to go out very long in that boat there and fill it up for. They, they 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 only the, all the early, they couldn't go out. Early on, they wouldn't even take food with them. They thought it, they had a superstition against taking food. Later on, yeah. they changed that and took boxes of food. They just drink cod liver before they left and do a prayer and go out. And, you know, the, but it was only a day. Yeah, but it took them a full day to go out, row up, because they had to row, and they could only get the fish fairly close to shore. So they'd go, that's why they'd follow it to different places for the migration, because they'd know when the fish had come close to shore, because they couldn't go out very far right. either. That size boat, I, I, I fished one summer as a kid with my uncle, and we had a 40 foot on that boat out here in the sound. And one evening we caught 500 fish. And the water line that yep. was about like that. And I'm constantly, as a kid, about 13, on that build pump. Getting it. Getting that yeah. thing before we yeah. get the shore. So that boat there, they couldn't handle that, even and that amount of fish. And they talk about, the other thing they talk about is they feeling, and that that is so dangerous for, because it's, it's really low. And they're in Arctic seas. Mm -hmm. And so they're talking, that's where a lot of boats flipped, because they were full. Yeah. Or, they also talk about somebody going to rescue, they see another boat tipping, and another boat goes to rescue them, and it always, in the, in the account, is they threw out all their fish and everything in their boat, and then went, because otherwise they couldn't get the people in there, of course. Because mm -hmm. they would only take, you know, they're small boats, they won't take With them. With that first, first video we had there, of the big, bigger ship, that one there would have smaller boats that were left over the side to do the fishing. That bigger boat was the, the more ship. modern boat. The more yeah. modern boat. Oh, the modern boat. The first, first, first yeah. slide. Yeah. The very first picture 
Oh, 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 that's a modern boat. Yeah, that's a yeah, that's, they, they, that's have, they have smaller boats that fish and bring the fish to them now. Well, those are those are nets, so they usually do the nets. Yeah. They pull out the nets on that and pull the dips not yeah. And the, they have the, the smaller boats corral the net around. Yeah, yeah. To circle around. Yeah, the zodiac. So any other questions? I'm curious about the markets for the fish, the changing markets. So presumably when Denmark was in charge. They came over and took all the fish. Okay. Mm -hmm. yes. and, and then what other markets did they have? Well, Iceland, I mean, Iceland's cod is, you know, there, somehow theirs is left, and theirs has remained, even though Nova Scotia has become completely depleted. So they sell it all over the world, basically. Bako Yao, the dry fish from, uh -huh. Uh -huh. from Portugal and, and Spain, that's mostly Icelandic. So that's so very valuable. They get lots of money for that. So they were selling it here really early. So it's, it's huge markets now, of course, it's international markets. So that was the big, you know, after the 2008 collapse, when that's what, you know, England and Holland were saying, all right, we invested all in there, and now we've lost all our money, so Iceland has to now pay us all back for it. Iceland said, nah. But they, they said, this is what you have to do, and they offered, you know, uh, they said, you have to pay it back in, for, for an international loan, a very high interest rate, and they said, the way you'll pay it back is we will have your fish for the next 20 years. And I said, we're not losing our independence again. So what's the population of Iceland right now? It, right now it's 300, well, it's almost, I think it's, it's like 325,000. Yeah, that's cool. That's about mm -hmm. what it is now. Yeah. yeah. We're talking a suburb of Seattle. We're talking about yeah. some of the large in the water. Snohomish County. Yeah, it's not much. Snohomish County. But the, I mean, it's not very big, but they almost all live in Drake anyway. Is there. 80% live in Drake 82%. Is there, uh, is the, the geothermal uh, you know, the power generation from Iceland, is that the, their main export? Uh, and they don't export. That's an old they, 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 they unfortunately do. That's a very mm -hmm. political question. Well, they're. Mm, I, mm. <laughs> if they have, oh, it is a fantastic power source. Yeah. It, there's just a few places in Iceland that doesn't have it, and everybody else, their electricity is almost free. And that's why they can have outdoor swimming pools and they swim all winter outside. They leave it and things like that. The people leave their windows open all winter, too. Just, but, 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 it's in, um, a while ago, they started um, putting in aluminum smelters. Alcoa, something like that. They're doing it, a, you know, a penny on the dollar. Iceland is losing so much on it. It's, it's a pouring in the aluminum from someplace else, the ore, smelting it, polluting it, in Iceland, and then taking it out. And Iceland's getting about nothing out of this. The current government, well, they just have an election, but so who knows what's coalition, but the the government before this one, they were talking about building, I think they've got three now, and they're talking about building them for 10. And there's huge protests in Iceland against this, because if they build these, by everybody's prediction, they will be out of geothermal in 10 years. And then we'll get nothing back, and then we'll have to do it. Oh, free trade. <laughs> <laughs> it's free, all right, they get nothing back. Yeah. So this is, um, I have many, many friends in Iceland who are protesting this. Well, how much of the country is free of ice? There are, there are um, more and more of it all the time, actually. Yeah. There are a few very large glaciers. Yeah. Um, but most of it's free of ice. It's, it, it's just certain glaciers, uh, large glaciers, but most of it's free of ice. But the whole center of it is a high plateau, and it gets so much snow in the winter, and it's so cold that it's uninhabitable. It's like a desert. Two it's a high seasons, plateau. Yeah. No, 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 they have three seasons. They do, I mean, four, four seasons. They have a beautiful, it's just, it's sort of like the weather here, only, 10 to 15 degrees colder, actually. It's not that different. It's very, it's very, it's different from the north to the south, of course, because the south, the Reykjavik, is about the same latitude as Fairbanks. But the north is right on the Arctic Circle. 
You don't get as much rain in the north, and there's some pockets in the north which are actually warmer. But on the whole, you get more snow in the north, but you get a lot more sun. So people like, some people, uh, Akare, the town up there, people consider that it gets better weather than Reykjavik. It gets a lot of sleet. What Reykjavik gets a lot of is just sleet and <laughs> crappy <laughs> rain. How about terrible? They have some reindeer they call on the east side that's been brought in. Right. Oh yeah, they don't they don't have any native um, large animals. They just have the Arctic quality. That's it. They have a lot of horses, don't they? Native horses? They they native, I don't know what that means, no, but they, they have they, been, they, yeah, they're 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 they're